How does a person answer why something happens? When you look at the findings in different fields, scant is the part of life in which we live. To attain the highest values. Um, you have a fascinating story, which we'll get into in a second, how you became a top 20 professional poker player. Um, but I want to start with, you, you strike me as someone right now, you're a professional poker player, but you're also a professional businessman. You're just very professional in everything that you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, when do you think you decided, intentionally decided to become professional? Oh, uh, I, I can't help but think of the Stephen Pressfield designation between an amateur and a professional. Yeah. And I think of it, uh, I know you talk a lot about deliberate practice, and I think that's a good distinction of I am try to be very systematic in everything that I pursue. Um, I view in a large part, thanks to poker, the world through a game lens. And any game that I want to participate in, I, I want to win. Um, whether, there, whether there's an external competitor or whether I'm just competing with the ghost of myself. And I always try to deconstruct my goals into what are those critical sub-skills or mm. mindsets or network, what have you, what, what, what is that leverage point which allows mm. me to maximally move forward towards this North Star? Mm. Um, because I, I, something that I've realized that there's generally a most direct path mm. and that, that's what this approach allows me to discover. So have you always thought like that? Like, you know, back in college, I know your, your story kind of starts in college around, um, 2001, I think, when Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker. But like even before that, were you always thinking like that? Or is it something that you made a switch? You know, I think it was always there, but it's definitely strengthened over time. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'll start with what got me into poker in the first yeah. place, and that might demonstrate. Maybe. So I, I think like many you know, young men of, I was very drawn to games. Um, it started as uh, video games, um, whether, you know, Super Nintendo or later on computers and, you know, then Xbox type stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I had my, my early success in this game called Microsoft Ants, where I was the best player in the world, which it sounds oh. a lot more impressive than it really was because it's a pretty <laughs> small player pool, uh, mm. maybe, you know, a few hundred players at its peak. But this uh, Ants is a kind of early version of StarCraft, um, yeah. you know, with kid, very kid friendly, but you have real time action where you're, you're trying to coordinate many actions, macro and micro at the same time against other players. So accumulate mm. resources, stop other players from accumulating resources. Mm. And that that's when I really started to apply this systematic approach to games because there were clearly things that allowed someone to win even if they weren't wouldn't be directly characterized as skill. Just every game, due to the the finite nature of its rules, has certain things that can be exploited in order to in order to come out on top and so mm -hmm. i was always trying to discover these these hidden exploitations um, after ants i started playing on the yahoo suite um, so some dabbling in chess which i've honestly never been that good at but i had the most success in gin rummy mm -hmm. where uh, once again i i achieved a, a perfect rating and the gin equivalent of elo i think to my knowledge i'm only one of 10 players who's ever done that and that was a game where you're playing one-on-one -on -one against another player where you have cards in your hand that are held the entire time. That's the difference between traditional Rummy. You never put down your hand. And yeah. so there's a lot of incomplete information. You're trying to mm -hmm. guess what your opponent has in their 10-card hand based on the cards they pick up and put down. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a large amount of luck that's in Jin. So 
being one of the top players, I still only won about 65% of the time. And the big part of what I took away from Jin is this deception element that I'm telling this story based on the cards that I pick up and put down. And so if I can change that narrative, I can get my opponent to hold cards that I don't need and to discard the cards that I need. Mm -hmm. And um, that uh, I, I started to, this was, I think it was about 14 at the time. Uh, I started to make friends within the gin world and a couple of them tipped me off to poker, which was very much in its inf infancy, the first sites were, yeah. were popping up. And I started playing free roll tournaments on my parents' dial up internet where it blew me away that, that wow, I can, I can invest nothing. And if I outlast these 10,000 players, maybe I'll win a hundred dollars, which is yeah. a lot of money when you're, when you're 14, right. you know, until someone, until someone calls in and I was kicked off of the tournament because uh, there's only one phone line and only one computer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I played these for fun. I made, I made a little bit of money, nothing crazy, but I really started to, get serious about the game and get very interested. And everything really, really accelerated. I think a lot of luck is timing and happening mm. to be paddling before the wave comes. I started college in 2004, right yeah. after, as you mentioned, Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker. And mm. so poker was everywhere. It was mm. on ESPN, that seemed like 24 hours a day, travel channel, et cetera. And if you were going to hang out as a college male in the dorms, you were playing poker. And so I already had a little bit of that games background. So it allowed me to have a little bit of a head start. But um, that's when I really started playing, particularly in person, kind of underground campus games. And when I found out that some of the players who I thought weren't particularly good were making decent amounts of money for re playing for real money online it's like oh well i'm better than them of course mm -hmm. i should be making money so i started playing some sit and goes um, which is like nine nine player one table tournaments and then multi-table tournaments mm -hmm. um, had started having some success um, in my my sophomore year where i would i would i would finish my my last class on thursday and essentially just play from thursday night until monday morning straight with you know some naps in there and a lot of a lot of weekends, I would put in a hundred dollars, and I'd wake up on Monday morning with twenty thousand. Yes. Um, and it was it wasn't it wasn't as much of ability. It was kind of it felt like if you had a pulse, you could win money at this point because mm. there was such a boom. There was so many new players. No one there was no information out there other than what people saw on ESPN. So no one knew what they were doing. And it was very much a golden age where despite being way overcommitted as a college student in terms of being ambitious in school clubs and stuff, mm -hmm. I was able to, to do pretty well and you know start to pay off my college tuition. Mm -hmm. um, I, I switched over to cash games in my, my junior year after I'd had some, some big success in tournaments. I wanted a new challenge. Mm -hmm. And cash games are you can buy in with money and you can cash out at any time. So you're, you're mm -hmm. playing with the money in front of you. And that this, this is what I'm primarily known for these days is cash games. And building a pot. I, building pots, exactly. Yeah. And I immediately jumped in and started playing 24 games of low stakes cash games at a time, which is, uh, you know, about a decision every one to two seconds mm -hmm. and didn't win at first. It was, I was paying a lot of tuition as I like to put it up front, yeah. but just <laughs> through the really tight feedback loops of playing lots of hands, yeah. and figuring out what other players were doing that was working quickly got to the point that I was that was making a decent income from it. Um, you know, fast forward, I graduated at a pretty unlucky time to graduate 2008. Um, I was going mm -hmm. into the auto industry, which put me in a hiring purgatory. So I'd accepted mm -hmm. a position, but the position wasn't ready for me. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time, I was able to dedicate myself to poker. I asked, what would it look like to treat this as a full-time job? And so mm -hmm. the the 10 to 20 hour a week around classes became 80 hours a week of intense study and practice. Mm -hmm. And within about a year and a half, um, you know, with the help of other players, um, that's when I reached that, that point of being ranked in the top 20. So when you were in that journey, did you have moments of conscious or, or unconscious incompetence? 
we you so like were you able to identify the things you needed to work on and and so you were like deliberate in that I think poker by definition is primarily unconscious and I I think a lot of the the inflection points in my game were were usually brought about by someone doing something that either really annoyed me. They made a play against me that I didn't know what the correct response was and it mm. put me in a difficult position. Mm. Um, or I just stumbled upon something by accident that worked and the, the opportunity was trying to deconstruct why it worked and see if that, that tactic extended to other situations. Mm. And there's, there's a lot of trial and error that needs to happen. And so there's really no substitute for just playing lots and lots and lots of hands. At yeah. this point in my career, I've played over 2 million hands. And the, the key is, we t I, I touched on this, this notion of a feedback loop, is yeah. to really close that loop. And so a lot of players I see don't have that metacognitive ability to, when they make them, they make the same mistakes over and over again and never try to you know, peel back the onion of why these, these patterns are reoccurring or to just move more towards the exploration, giving themselves permission to do things that they could look really, really dumb and could be very large mistakes, but through this exploration, discovering new branches on the game tree. And so every session that I played, I would review the hands afterwards. And my goal was to learn something new every time that I sat down. And so what, what a lot of people don't realize about poker, and I think applies to lots of other things in life, although at varying speeds, is that I mentioned in the early days of poker, you, you basically needed a pulse. It's like, if you knew the hands to play, you didn't yeah. do anything really dumb, it was hard not to make money. Um, yeah. But as, as people got more experience, as technology progressed, players got better very, very quickly. I think it's, it's generally an exponential curve or just in order to maintain your standing, you need to be twice as good every mm. year. Um, mm. and, and so I not only did I need to improve, I needed to improve faster than the other people I was playing against. And I think this was a really big part of it was mm. I was making adjustments to my game on a daily basis. Mm. Yeah, so we're gonna get into some of that rigor that you've you've put into your um your poker career and i think you is a big part of your performance coaching business forcing function 